This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It's for promotional purposes only, is not for forward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance is not a guide to future performance, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only, and references made to individual securities should not constitute or form part of any offer or solicitation to issue, sell, subscribe, or purchase the security. Hello, and welcome to Trust Radio, the investment trust podcast hosted by Janice Henderson Investors, where we take a deep dive into the questions investors really want to know the answers to. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by Job Curtis to discuss factors currently affecting the UK market, what they mean for investors, and how he's navigating these challenges. Job, welcome to the show. Very pleased to be here. So global dividends hit a record high in 2021 thanks to a surge in dividend payments, primarily from banks and miners. We also saw bumper payouts in Europe, Australia and the UK. As 2022 gets underway, however, dividend growth is set to slow as companies face supply chain disruptions, soaring energy prices and higher input costs. And these obviously have been made worse by the Russia-Ukraine war. How are you navigating the current market environment? The environment we have at the moment does throw up risks, and, but also some opportunities. And you refer to soaring energy prices, and clearly BP and Shell are major oil companies. And we also hold in our portfolio, along with those two companies, Total, a French-based international oil company. And they certainly, you know, their profitability benefits from, from the higher oil price. Also, you know, we are in a more inflation environment. It was already inflationary before the Ukraine war, and it's been exacerbated by it, as you say, with the energy prices going up and also various supply chain issues. And as a result, I think there's also a general perception that the economy is going at full throttle. I mean, there was massive policy relaxation during the pandemic for understandable reasons, which saved a lot of jobs and kept the economy from going into a depression. But now we're in a situation where interest rates are, are very low relative to pace week activity and you know employment's strong and as a result you've got a rising interest rate environment we've seen in the uk that interest rates have risen to 0.75 the bank of england's made three increases in interest rates and we've also had interest rate increase in the us and so overall city london's portfolio is is quite diversified and we have as a kind of core around 20 percent in the consumer staples type stocks which are selling and making the everyday goods that, that you know you tend to buy in all circumstances. And that's a very good sort of core bedrock for the portfolio. But we know we do have exposure to our oil and mining companies, which have done well recently. And also, you know, we've got reasonable exposure to financials where we've got higher than average to insurers and we've got some banks in the portfolio both slightly below average exposures. The other thing I'd mention is, you know, we, we, we take quite a conservative approach. So we like companies, particularly in cyclical industries, which are sort of industries that swing around a lot with the economy. We like companies with um, strong balance sheets, i.e. not having a lot of debt. You know, we, that, that's our overall preference. Those companies are better able to continue paying their dividends in more difficult times. Now, taking a closer look at the UK market, inflation is at record highs, taxes are set to increase, and wage growth is behind the rate of inflation. Now, this means British households are facing a major squeeze on their finances. And historically, this has led to changes in consumption patterns. Has this impacted your asset allocation anyway? And are, are there any businesses or sectors in the portfolio that will thrive because they offer a good value proposition for consumers? Well, inflation did get a lot higher in the 1970s. So we, you know, we're not um, at, at record highs. It is the highest it has been for two or three decades. In terms of the asset allocation, as I was saying before, you know, we, it's quite diversified and we do have some areas like resources companies such as oil and mining, which are well set, and financials are fairly well set. I mean, overall, we're underrepresented relative to what you might call consumer discretionary sectors like, like retailers, so we have some good, good quality ones. The other side of it to throw in is that during the pandemic, a lot of people saved quite a lot because you couldn't spend, you know, you were locked into your home and, yeah. you know, weren't allowed to go on holiday abroad, for example. There's quite a good bank of savings out there and um, which could continue to support economic growth. And, you know, obviously the, the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic has been the acceleration of trends such as digitalization and e-commerce. How are businesses in the UK reinventing themselves to stay competitive? And could you provide some examples of this within your portfolio? 
what you say is absolutely correct, you know, that this trend of digitization sort of been happening for a while and it was massively accelerated. Look at my own personal substances at home. We, we started ordering our supermarket shop on, online That's and having it delivered, <laughs> which we'd never done before. And, and now we're continuing to, to do so for our main supermarket. And actually, I think a very good example of a company that's adapted has been Tesco's, which is our biggest, I mean, I count it as a consumer staple because it's so dependable, but it's our biggest sort of retail holding in, in the portfolio. It's, you know, going back to your previous question, it's very competitive in terms of its um, costs and, you know, value for money. And they've certainly got their act together in recent years as regards that. But they've also impressively kind of transformed their business model. So they, you know, are a big participant in e-commerce and uh, many of their customers order online and have their um, food delivered from, from Tesco. So I think that's a very good example of a company that's really adapted and, and straddled both areas. And I think, um, I mean, there'll be some companies that are purely digital, but, but a lot of the strongest franchise are able to adapt into the new world as well as um, maintain the existing. I mean, another company in a sort of different area, which is slightly forgotten about, but is kind of at the heart of kind of the digital economy is actually um, Vodafone. We do all rely on the kind of basic infrastructure of telecommunications for the whole digital economy to function. And I think they did a great job in during the whole COVID lockdowns, no one particularly complained about not getting good service, you know, a reception. We almost forget some areas of the country still don't get a good reception. But overall, the reception has improved. And it's amazing how much more we get on our phones than we, we ever used to. It's just right. extraordinary, you know, how much on, on your little mobile phone. But to be honest, I mean, Vodafone, where they have a, obviously a UK operation, which people are very familiar with, their biggest operation, in fact, of all is in Germany, where they're number two. And they've also got operations across Africa. It's a profitable company, uh, makes some big profits, but it hasn't really enjoyed the growth um, right. with, that I think in a way it's deserved. Yeah. I think the customers had a very good deal and that it's been very competitive. And people, you know, whenever the sort of service improves, your bill doesn't go up as much as the, the service improvement. There's always the possibility of shopping around and changing to a different network. You know, we haven't got a massive position in, in Vodafone and it's, it's not been our most successful share. It hasn't been, hasn't been too bad. Interesting. Yeah, I think businesses have always got to adapt. I mean, even, I mean, in the consumer staples area, we've got some companies like Diageo, which is one of our biggest holdings. And this is the biggest alcoholic beverage company in the world. And, you know, they've got some heritage brands like Johnny Walker with Scotch Whiskey, which has been around for years. But they, mm. they have to kind of market, they, you know, they've got to start marketing them to, you know, the millennials in a digital way. Mm. And they've got to kind of refresh them. And, and also, they've got to expand into other areas within alcoholic beverages. And, I think Diageo being particularly skilled, and they're, they're the biggest in the United States in, in, alcohol, in spirits, not, not beer. They've actually very cleverly kind of moved into tequila, which is the fastest growing category in the US. And they've made a couple of actually Don Julio, and they've built up as well. And so I think that's an example of a kind of heritage company, you know, adapting um, with great, great brands. But, you know, unless they, these companies invest and adapt to the sort of way the world's changing, you know, then they're going to, if you're either going forward, you go backwards. And I yeah. think Diageo's a good example of a company that's continuing to go forwards. Definitely. I think they've done a great job marketing to millennials, especially through, you know, celebrity endorsements such as George Clooney and P. Diddy. But I would like to talk about valuations a little bit. Since the 2016 Brexit referendum, the UK stock market has lagged behind its international peers. And as a result, a wide valuation gap has become ingrained in the market. Some say that the UK sector makeup is largely responsible for this. What are your thoughts on this? And do you see this gap closing anytime soon? Uh, yes, well, I think you're right. It is partly the sector makeup, and in particular, um, the whole world index is very much dominated by the American market. And obviously, the American stock market's got some technology type companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, who've really kind of you know been hugely successful. We in the UK don't have any equivalent. In the city of London, we have held Microsoft for about eight or nine years, so we've had some benefit f from that. City of London Investment Trust. So it is part of the sector makeup. That's now sort of kicking back a bit in, in the UK's favour because we've, we've got quite a sort of big energy sector and obviously that's now doing rather well. And, and so actually since the beginning of 2022, the UK's actually started to perform. It's been the best performing of the major markets on the day we're talking. But I think um, there is more to it than that. I mean, even when you compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges, I the same type of companies, the UK's on a discount. As a result, you've seen a lot of takeover activity. And, you know, because overseas companies and private equity firms have, you know, spotted the value in the UK. And we've, we've had a lot of takeover bids. I mean, in City London's portfolio, uh, we had Morrison's, the supermarket 
chain, very good company, and that was very undervalued. The share price wasn't doing much. But, you know, we, we were happy to hold it, good dividend pair. And eventually, two private equity groups fought for it, and it was taken over. And we also had Daily Mail in general, which was, was taken private by the Rovermere family. So we've had two takeovers in our portfolio. But I think takeovers, you know, will continue, you know, while the UK market is 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 at this big discount. You know, people measure these things in different ways, but it is commonly agreed the UK is looking particularly cheap. And it, it's partly the composition of the index, but it is even, even when you look at it on a kind of like-for-like basis, it, it's still quite cheap. It's interesting, isn't it? Because one of the criticisms of the UK market is the lack of so-called you know, growth companies within fintech or medtech, for example. Is this composition starting to shift a little bit? Well, I think the, the UK, um, you know, we're a much smaller country than America, but I think we actually punch above our weight in terms of kind of innovation. I mean, if you look at what our great universities achieve, and there are examples, I mean, of smaller companies, but I think of two large companies which are held in the City of London's portfolio where you've seen innovation. And the first is AstraZeneca in conjunction with Oxford University. They provided the COVID vaccine that a lot of us had and they were the first um, to the market. You know, And I think um, it's, um, that's a great example of a British company innovating and, uh, and they've actually been very successful across their drug pipeline. So I think the pharmaceutical sector is actually a sector we're pretty strong at with AstraZeneca leading and that's held in Citadel's portfolio. And another example, in renewable energy, we've got a very large wind farm you know, sector for, for windy weather and, <laughs> and the North Sea is, is relatively shallow. So it's actually ideal for kind of to put um, these wind farms up, you know, S, within City's portfolio, City London's portfolio, we have SSE, which is our largest um, wind farm uh, company. It's also leading in hydroelectric energy in, in the UK. And so that's a good example of a company, you know, at the forefront of, of kind of renewable energy generation. So, yeah, I think the UK, you know, certainly... US market's got a bigger tech sector, but you can certainly find, I mean, City London's more focused on on the larger companies. And, you know, we have a fairly conservative style. Some of, sometimes smaller technology companies can be quite volatile. You can you can make several times your money, but you can lose all your money. You know, it's that type, whilst City London's more a kind of conservative type style. So it probably, you know, there are other funds out there where you can um, get exposure to small UK tech stocks. But as I'm sure there are some, you know, they tend not to pay dividends, you know, rightly so given their stage of development. But um, but I'm sure there are good opportunities out there to complement someone who holds City of London Investment Trust. You know, before we finish, I'd like to briefly touch on the conversation surrounding decarbonisation and the shift towards, you know, clean energy. Now, this conversation has obviously been intensified by the Russia-Ukraine war, but the status quo, so to speak, has been to exclude miners and big oil from portfolios. However, within the City of London Investment Trust, you hold some of these stocks. Do you think these companies have a role to play in this transition? Well, I think we're discovering at the moment that we still, you know, we can't really do without oil and, and natural gas. You know, the fact is, you know, transportation and heating our homes, you know, it is still vital. And there's the whole plastic complex, you know, plastics, you know, which are derived, you know, from hydrocarbons. So obviously there's a long transition period when we're going to transition to a lower carbon economy. It's already taking place. And, you know, our renewable electricity sector has grown massively in, in recent years and now supplying a decent chunk of our the nation's electricity needs. But until battery technology improves on a dark night when it's not much wind and it's cold, you know, gonna need, you need a backup system. So uh, so I think you can't, just cannot dismiss these companies. You know, they still have a role to play. And, you know, within the energy sector, you know, natural gas, for example, is a lot less polluting than, say, coal. And in this country has reduced its output. of We've virtually got no coal-powered electricity stations left, you know, and we've, we've moved more towards natural gas, which is, is an improvement for sure. So I think, you know, in the end of the day, City of London investors, we don't exclude companies. But our objective is to grow our investors' income and capital over the long term. And so, you know, we, we, we're going to have companies in the portfolio if they're legitimate businesses, which obviously oil companies are, you know, in our portfolio, if they can help achieve our objectives. But we do want kind of long-term sustainability. And, you know, we have to feel there's a sort of end value there. BP and Shell are and Total, the three I hold in the oil sector, are transitioning their companies to, to a kind of lower carbon future. And I have to say, if you exclude these companies, um, you have no voice. And so, you know, we can, we and we do meet with, with all the companies we invest in and represent our views and our investors' views to them. And, have, and they'll listen to us. Whilst if you don't have any shares in them, why, why should they listen to you? So I think, um, I think it's very important to sort of have an active role. And, and some, you know, I think the situation is, more complicated it looks. I mean, mining companies, for example, I mean, copper, 
you know, if we're going to electrify the economy, you know, huge advanced electrification, think of all, if everyone starts buying electric cars, think of the amount of um, charging we'll need and, um, and the amount of copper wire that's going to be needed in electric cars. You know, miners that kind of have got copper mines that are kind of should be quite well placed longer term. You know, it's a very important area for sure. And, but, it, you know, it does require so sort of quite deep thinking rather than kind of um, knee-jerk reactions. That's how I'd look at it. And, but at the end of the day, we are focused on, you know, our objectives of growing our investors' income and capital over the long term. And, and we like to have a voice in the companies uh, that we invest in. Well, Joe, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved you may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Sanderson Investors. Janus Sanderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Sanderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanders Investors UK Limited, Reg Number 906355. Janus Sanders Fund Management UK Limited, Reg Number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, Reg Number 2606646. Six. Each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate in London. EC2M 3AE and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and Henderson Management S.A. Reg number B22848 at 2 Route de Bitmore L1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission du Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janice Henderson, Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright, Janice Anderson Group PLC.